Hello, how are you doing? I'm Eric, and there are a lot of classic books that I often think to myself, I really should have read that, but, but one day I'll get around to it. Uh, but somehow that day never really comes. Now, since it is about to be the new year, it is the perfect time to make a resolution to finally get to reading some classics. And since it's going to be the year 2022, I have neatly picked out 22 classic books uh, for inspiration in case you want to take on this challenge and read some of these books as well. And a lot of these books, uh, they have special anniversaries attached to them. Uh, either it's the anniversary date of the publication of the book or the anniversary date of the author's birth, or it's a book that is about to be made into a film. And so, you know, you want to read the book before watching the film, or there's another special reason uh, for, for picking it out. Uh, so I'm going to go through all of these books. Um, I'd love to know in the comments below if you'd like to read some of them uh, or if there are other classics that you're looking forward to, to reading this year. Uh, please let me know about that. Now to start off, I have a really big one. Yes, this is this is quite a challenge I know for a lot of people and probably the biggest challenge that, that you can have. Yes, it is Ulysses by James Joyce, which has a big anniversary date this, this year because it was published in its entirety for the very first time on February 2nd in uh, 1922, uh, which was the same year that James Joyce turned 40 years old. Can you imagine turning 40 and having written one of the greatest novels of all time, what's widely considered one of the greatest novels of all time of modernist literature, uh, this big massive epic uh, that takes as its uh, basis the uh, Homer's The Odyssey um, as, as inspiration for that, uh, the story of Leopold Bloom following him over the course of a single day in June 16th, uh, 1904, and now Every year, uh, June 16th is celebrated as uh, Bloomsday in, in Ireland. And uh, yeah, this is a novel which is quite a challenge because each section is written in a very different style. Um, he uses all sorts of different techniques and um, yeah, and draws upon uh, different literary uh, styles to, to create this, this story. And I have to admit, I've, I've only read some sections of it. Uh, even though I have a master's degree in, in literature and uh, and uh, so you know I love uh, Molly Bloom's soliloquy I'm at the very end of the novel I love the section commonly known as Night Town which is really surreal and weird and fantastic there are other sections which are quite a challenge and I've just never really got through but yeah I'm still reeling that James Joyce wrote this when he was 40 years old actually probably before he was 40 years old that, that when the final version of this came out uh, in its complete form when he turned 40. Um, I, I don't know about you, but, but my goals for before I turned 40 was to eat a pizza in Naples, um, which I did do, uh, but yeah, isn't, isn't quite on the level of, of having written uh, the, the greatest work of modernist literature. <laughs> I mean, just the explanatory notes for this novel, look at that. This is all just the explanatory notes. Next is a novel that you may not have heard of before. I hadn't heard of it before coming across it in uh, this book, and it's the novel all about H. Hatter, A Just by G. V. Dasani. Um, it's a novel from 1948, and I'm selecting it because uh, it is often called the Indian Ulysses, um, so it's a great thing to follow on from that. And yeah, I discovered it in this book called This Is the Canon, Decolonize Your Bookshelf in 50 Books, uh, because often when we talk about classic books, we're talking about literature um, from the West that is often written uh, by white men and uh, so I want to pick out some books that are slightly different from that and to diversify my, my bookshelf and yeah this is a, a great book which came out recently um, written by uh, three different writers and scholars uh, who all make uh, these suggestions 
of 50 different uh, books that are sort of outside what is typically considered the canon, but is which are often recognized as great pieces of world literature. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of amazing suggestions in here. Uh, but All About H. Hatter is a slightly comic novel about a man that is uh, the son of a European merchant and a lady from Penang, and he uh, goes on an adventure trying uh, to achieve enlightenment. So he visits seven different Asian cities and visits with seven different uh, sages um, who all have different areas of speciality and knowledge, uh, but his adventures don't really go as planned, and uh, so it's, it's meant to be quite a, a comic novel. It's probably a lot more fun to read than uh, Ulysses uh, as a whole, and Salman Rushdie says of this novel that it's a dazzling, puzzling, leaping prose is the first genuine effort to go beyond the Englishness of the English language. Now another suggestion from this book that I want to point out is Kindred by Octavia E. Butler, uh, which was first published in 1979, and I know a lot of people will say like, oh, that's too soon to, for it to be considered a classic, but I think it's, it's pretty much accepted now that this is a, now a classic of modern science fiction literature uh, because, yeah, it's been hugely influential. Uh, it's uh, Butler's novel about a woman in, uh, in the 1970s who wants to become a writer and finds herself being transported uh, back to the early 1800s where it's assumed that she's a slave and it's about an inter interracial relationship and uh, yeah, and how she moves backwards and forwards and, and time and the, the drama of that. I've been wanting to get around to it for, for ages and also I want to get around to reading it because it's being made into a limited series um, which will probably air sometime in uh, 2022 or maybe the year after, but I definitely want to read the book first. Next is a novel which is often considered a more traditional classic. It is Middlemarch by George Eliot, and I want to read this, uh, well actually reread this because I, I read it when I was in my early 20s, um, but I've been wanting to reread it for ages because it's quite a long book, there's a lot of detail in it. It's actually kind of two novels um, squashed into to one, and, uh, and I picked this out because uh, the serialization of this novel ended in 1872, so it'll be 150th anniversary of uh, the, the serialization of it um, first ended. Next is a good old time classic, Persuasion by Jane Austen, the story of a young woman who was once engaged to a Navy captain, but she was persuaded to break off that engagement, and several years later they meet up again. They're both still single. Will they or won't they get back together? You just have to read the book and see. And uh, I've never really got along with reading Jane Austen's books. I keep saying I'm, I'm gonna try to, to read her again. Will this be the year I finally get into Jane Austen? I don't know, just gonna have to wait and see. <laughs> but this is, uh, I wanted to get to reading this um, because there's gonna be a new Netflix adaptation of this novel uh, starring Dakota Johnson and Cosmo Jarvis, um, who's also a musician uh, as well as an actor. Uh, so yeah, I, I would like to get to reading this, you know, before seeing the Netflix film. Another much older classic probably the oldest classic uh, on this list of books I've made, uh, which is Maul Flanders by Daniel Defoe. This was first published anonymously in London in 1722, uh, so yeah, 300 years ago, and uh, I'm gonna read you out the full title of this, this novel. I'm gonna have to take a really deep breath. Okay, uh, Maul Flanders' original full title was the fortunes and misfortunes of the famous Maul Flanders, who was born in Newgate and during a life of continued variety for threescore years, besides her childhood was twelve year a whore, five times a wife, whereof once to her own brother, twelve year a thief, eight year a transported felon in Virginia, at last grew rich, lived honest, and died a penitent, written from her own memorandums. 
That was the original full title of this novel. They, they don't give titles to novels like that anymore, do they? Um, which basically, there's the whole plot of the novel right there in the, the title. I mean, we often talk about wanting to avoid spoiler alerts, but uh, if you have the entirety of what happens in the story in the title, then how do you avoid that? But, uh, but actually, after reading that title, I do really want to read this novel. Under the Greenwood Tree by Thomas Hardy. This was for first published 150 years ago in 1872. It was Thomas Hardy's second published novel, and it was originally published uh, anonymously. I, I don't know what it was with these writers uh, not wanting to put their names on the novels that they were publishing, uh, but uh, eventually it did come out in, under his own name, and it became recognized in the first in a series of novels that he wrote, um, which is referred to as the Wessex novels, um, which I think all takes place in a certain area of of the, the English countryside. And the, the story um, is about a group of musicians and uh, one choir master, um, I, I love the names in this, um, the choir master is um, called Dick Dewey, um, or maybe he's just a member of the, the choir, maybe he's not the choir master, and he um, becomes romantically involved with a comely new village schoolmistress who is called Fancy day, <laughs> what a name that is! Fancy day. Um, so yeah, I, I I'd like to get more into reading Thomas Hardy's work. I've read some of his like most famous uh, novels before, but um, as I talked about in an earlier video, I earlier this year I uh, traveled through Thomas Hardy country, and uh, just doing that sort of inspired me to want to read more of his books. Next, I want to reread a novel which is probably considered one of the greatest dystopian novels of all time, uh, which is 1984 by George Orwell, uh, the story of Winston living under Big Brother and the, the Thought Police. And I want to read this, uh, reread this, because uh, I, I read it for the first time, I think, when I was a teenager, um, so it's been a long time. Uh, but I want to reread it because it was just announced recently uh, that the great author Sandra Newman was granted permission uh, to write a novel uh, which is following the story of this, uh, but from Julia's perspective, um, who's Winston's uh, romantic attachment in this this novel, which is going to be so fascinating. So I'd like to re-familiarize myself uh, with the contents of this novel before that new novel comes out. Um, I mean, of course, she's just been granted permission to do it, so I don't think it's actually been written yet. It'll probably be a long time before it actually comes out, but you know, it's it's always a good time to reread 1984, I think. Speaking of dystopian classics, another one I want to read uh, for the first time is They by Kay Dick, which I'd never heard of before, um, but this is being republished by Favorite Books on uh, February 3rd. And uh, they, they claim that this, is, this novel was kind of lost for, been lost for the past 40 years. And uh, so now is just coming back into print. And Kay Dick uh, was a English woman that uh, worked in, in foils um, before going on to become an editor at a publisher. And she was actually an, an editor of uh, George Orwell's. And uh, so, so there's this sort of connection to, to that. And this is a story uh, about a kind of dystopian future where the, the rule ruling powers um, creatively inhibit uh, the, their citizens and uh, sort of like police um, their artistic abilities. So a group of creative bandits try to wrest free from this kind of control. It, it sounds fascinating. It's quite a, a short book, so I think it'll be like quick to get through, but it'll be so fascinating to read this for the first time. The Castle by Franz Kafka, and I selected this because Franz Kafka wrote a draft of it in 1922, uh, but this was uh, his final novel and it was left incomplete when he died a couple of years later in 1924. Uh, so he, he had started writing this and uh, just stopped one day, uh, actually mid-sentence, he, he stopped writing this. I mean, can you imagine having written most of a novel and then just in the middle of the sentence thinking, mm, no, I'm done, I'm giving up on this book, <laughs> um, which is what he did. And uh, before he died, he said to his uh, very good friend of his that he wanted all of his unpublished manuscripts to be burnt. Uh, his friend did not do that after Franz Kafka died. And uh, two years after Kafka's death, death the castle was published for the very first time. And uh, so I, I like that there's a, 
slight element of, of excitement to this, that this is a kind of like forbidden text that the author didn't want to actually appear, um, but it was published. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated uh, to read this. Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. This was first published in 1922, so a hundred years ago. And it's a satirical novel, uh, kind of making fun of middle-class American culture and uh, the, the the, the drive and push um, towards conformity. And uh, it's uh, often considered that this is a novel that probably um, helped him uh, actually win the Nobel Prize for Literature. And uh, so it's seen as like quite influential in that way. And obviously these are themes um, which we still live with today. So I'll be interested to, to read this for the first time and see, you know, if it still feels relevant. In a Glass Darkly by Sheridan Le Fano, uh, who was an Irish writer and and this was first published in 1872, so 150 years ago. And uh, these are stories which are like dark and, and gothic. And uh, one of the, the stories, Carmilla, um, I've read before and uh, was often considered uh, one of the first vampire stories um, ever written. And uh, I've read one of the other stories before, but um, I haven't read all of them. So uh, it'll be really fun to go back and uh, read the entire of this book. Transparent Things by Vladimir Nabokov. Uh, this was first published in 1972, so 50 years ago, and uh, it's quite a short novel. It's uh, only just over 100 pages long, and it's the, the story of a man um, that visits S Switzerland at four different points in his life, um, at, at very different stages of his life, and so it's sort of making up uh, a life, um, the story of a life, uh, you know, just through these these moments when he's uh, visiting this this place. And I have this beautiful uh, vintage international edition of it, which actually I have a number of uh, Nabokov's books in, in this edition, which you can see like just above my head there. And uh, I've been reading, meaning to read more of his work. Um, so yeah, I'd like to get to this. Next, I have a play which was first performed in January 1972 in Paris. And, uh, but I've, I've never read it or seen a production of the play. And that is Macbeth by Eugene Ionesco, uh, the great Romanian-born writer uh, who, who wrote and uh, lived in France for most of his life. And uh, he is considered one of the fathers of the theater of the absurd. I love his writing and work. Um, he only published uh, one novel, uh, but many different uh, plays which were quite wild and, and, and crazy in their tone and their characters. And this is obviously a play off from uh, Shakespeare's play Macbeth and uh, it was written during uh, the the Cold War and uh, yeah it's, it's a play on the uh, on corruption and power and ambition and cowardice and excess and so and and Ionesco includes within the play uh, the character of a lemonade seller um, which adds a new spin to the story. Kangaroo by D. H. Lawrence. This is a novel that was written in the year 1922 so a hundred years ago, uh, when D. H. Lawrence uh, migrated uh, with his wife Frida uh, to from uh, England to uh, the United States, and along the way they stopped in Australia, where uh, you can probably guess D. H. Lawrence got the inspiration to write this novel, Kangaroo. Now I read D. H. Lawrence's uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover for the very first time um, this past year, and really liked it uh, a lot more than I was expecting to. So I'd like to read some more of his work. Next is a novel which I'm so excited to reread. I first read it when I was in university and it helped me fall in love with this author's work and uh, become a lifelong fan and that is Jacob's Room by Virginia Woolf which was first published in 1922 so uh, it's the hundred year anniversary of it and uh, this was a very important novel um, because in Virginia Woolf's career because uh, it was her third third published novel and it marked a really big stylistic change in her writing. And Virginia Woolf uh, said of this book uh, that she found out how to begin at 40 years old to say something in my own voice. And you can really see if you read Virginia Woolf's earlier novels that yeah, there's a big stylistic shift in this and that it um, follows its story of uh, its protagonist mainly through his absence and so sort of like impressions um, from his life and uh, yeah and, and 
how she does that is is so moving and, and powerful and uh, yeah so I'm really excited to, to read this again. If you've not read Virginia Woolf before then I think this is a great place to start. Then I have a poem uh, which is often considered one of the greatest poems ever written and uh, also a great work of modernist literature that is The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot uh, which was first published in yes 1922 and uh, in April there's going to be a new edition of this novel which is actually a facsimile uh, of the original manuscript so I think you'll be able to see it in its original form which is really exciting. I always love looking at like the original manuscript of it and uh, I've never read this poem in its entirety before. I do remember the line from it uh, which is like one of those famous lines I think uh, which is uh, I can measure my life out in teaspoons or, or something like that uh, which I think I think that's from this poem <laughs> but uh, but I always really relate to that um, especially these days having uh, tea, a cup of tea after a cup of tea, and I see all of these teaspoons collecting in my sink, and I think, yep, there's my life. <laughs> a book of short stories, which was first published in 1922, is The Garden Party and Other Stories by Catherine Mansfield, uh, which is 14 tales. Um, many of them are set in the author's uh, native New Zealand. Uh, I had read these uh, stories many years ago, um, but I really don't remember much from them at all, except that I really enjoyed them and so uh, I'm looking forward to to rereading some of these and it's uh, published uh, the, the edition I have is this uh, Penguin Modern Classics um, which comes with an introduction uh, by Lorna Sage uh, who was a teacher of mine and a great inspiration of, of mine and so by the way uh, if you want another like book um, that gives you like an inspiration or kind of like reading list you know sort of like this book uh, just recently uh, the Penguin Modern Classics um, was celebrating an anniversary of theirs and they came out with this big complete edition of all of the Penguin modern classics. Um, so if you want to set yourself a really big reading challenge you could get a copy of this book and it just lists all of the different Penguin modern classics which is just so fascinating to flip through. Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse was also first published in 1922. This is the story of uh, an individual's journey towards enlightenment. It's kind of like the story of the Buddha. It's uh, written in a very lyrical style. I had read it many years ago um, but don't remember all too much detail from it so uh, this would be really enjoyable to reread. Another book of short stories is The Real Story of Ah Q and Other Tales from China by Lu Shun and this was first published in 1922. Uh, I think The Real Story of Ah Q uh, is the, the longest piece in uh, this book. It's a, it's a novella and it was quite famous in China at the time it was published and I think a lot of people were speculating about who Ah Q was really based on. The great Portuguese writer and Nobel Prize winner Jose Saramago was born on November 16th 1922 and I've read many of his novels and, and loved them and if you've never read him before I'd really recommend reading his novel Blindness which is this incredible work of dystopian literature uh, but I've never read his very first novel uh, which is Manual of Painting and Calligraphy, a, a novel, which is the story of a struggling artist and it's a, a romance and uh, about people living under a dictatorship. Um, so yeah, I'd really like to give a try to his first work. Now for my final choice I'm going to be a bit tricksy because it's a novel which doesn't actually exist or it might exist but we just don't know where it is. <laughs> so in December of 1922 uh, Ernest Hemingway was in Paris and a valise of his uh, containing all of his manuscripts that he had written over the past year was stolen and uh, it just vanished and nobody knows what happened to it and Ernest Hemingway claims that he had written some of his greatest work in the past year and it was in this valise and now it's gone forever. Was he telling the truth? Was he lying? 
who really knows? Uh, but actually, there's an account of it in this really great book, In Search of Lost Books, uh, The Forgotten Stories of Eight Mythical Volumes by Giorgio van Straten. And I read this a while ago. It is such an entertaining and fascinating read because when we talk about classic books, you know, we're obviously only talking about the books that have been passed down through generations that have been reprinted and uh, continued to remain in circulation. But there are so many books which have probably vanished from view, like might have been published at one time, but no existing copies um, still remain, uh, or the manuscripts of them were, were just lost. And I think that's so fascinating to think about. And this is such an interesting book that I'd really recommend reading. Um, so I just wanted to like playfully um, point that out at the, the very end of the book. And obviously one of the section deals with this issue of Ernest Hemingway, and he kind of questions whether like, like well, obviously the author would say it's his greatest work that was in this valise, but who really knows and who will ever know? So those are all the books I want to talk about. Um, like I said, let me know in the comments um, if you've read any of these books and would recommend them, or if you're interested in reading them for the first time, or rereading them because they're classics and you can always read these books any number of times and probably get more out of them, you know, especially as you get older in your life, and we'll probably get, yeah, much more from them. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a very happy new year, and I will speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.